Hey, Ed, how you doing? I'm good. How about yourself? I am doing pretty darn good. Uh, as you know, we've been talking about the Toronto Zoo and the upcoming project that we have possible as a build a stream day for aquascapes and contractors. And after much back and forth, we were going through the lion, the tiger, the river hog, and I think we finally settled on the hyena. Mufasa. Ooh. Do it again. Mufasa. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's awesome river rock yeah we we thought the tiger might be the most enjoyable but the, the significant size increase to make a, an impact mm -hmm. was too great the lions would have been an amazing opportunity but the logistics and the power mm -hmm. opportunities everything there would have been months instead of weeks and i believe we have three weeks until you join us in, in canada so we don't have quite that much time and the hyena although it has a water feature the water feature is a pump and dump concrete pool that they have to bleach on a daily basis it's not an ideal system and that's kind of what we were hoping for is a side-by-side -side comparison same animal there isn't a better way of testing out one system versus another got it got it got it no Oh, that that sounds great so they are draining and cleaning on a routine basis so is that because the animals are in the water they're feeding in the water in my mind when i'm picturing those animals it seems like it's hot dusty dry <laughs> yeah. kind of. i agree when you actually meet the hyenas they feel like the mixture of a cat and a dog so they're okay. they seem friendlier which might be the most dangerous part about them they seem actually friendly and what the keepers have told us they've actually been very helpful in this planning part is that they love to go up to the water spout when it's filling up the pool this pool is a concrete pool that is in full sun at all times so and it's stagnant very quickly uh, algae blooms come up i believe they bring their food into the water to wash it they did say that they will urinate or defecate in it but their poop is bone it's essentially like calcium. So they've showed us an example That's crazy. and it's hard as a rock. So they'll chew up all their bone. And then I guess the calcium isn't absorbed. So it, it just becomes a solid. It's almost like an early stage limestone. That's crazy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. One of the considerations and the fears is that the only thing that a hyena can't digest is rubber. They can eat steel, nuts and bolts, no problem. They'll pass it right through. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So, <laughs> so there are a lot of unique components here, I guess, that, that we have to deal with. Animal safety is number one. Yeah, and I'm sure for yourself, as well as for all the animal keepers as well. So we're going to have to barricade that rubber liner as much as possible. I think we can do that by bringing in some big giant boulders. But I'm also thinking almost like a hybrid type system where we use the rubber membrane to hold the water in place and then we can cover it up with a material that we call a concrete cloth and it is embedded with portland cement so when we fully saturate this cloth with water it's gonna it's gonna create a shell on top of the liner which is going to resist them from digging in things like that large boulders on top if they get in between some of the large boulders it's going to be this concrete cloth material then it will be a heavy duty fabric then it will be the rubber liner <laughs> so i think we're it's multiple layers of things it sounds like they're pretty powerful powerful animals and could do some damage if they really wanted to. Their jaw strength is incredible. And I was told that they have, I think like a four or five year old level intelligence. So they are yeah. curious and they do yep. like to explore. So they said that anything fresh dug, they're going to be interested in. And the fact that we're going to have like 30 people there, they're going to literally follow the scent of every individual as they come around, which is incredible. That's unbelievable. You mentioned that they like, when they're filling up the pool, they like that kind of splashing water. Yes, they Sometimes. apparently will stick their heads under, uh, drink from it. I'm hoping some white water action will get them curious enough to go in. We're planning on a fairly large cooling area up the wetland filter. Okay. And then at the bottom, I'm hoping closest to the viewing, is the most powerful falls. That's a design strategy that I use on a, on a routine basis. We could have the wetland start all the way on the top, and then we could add in other water, I guess, in other areas. So it increases that flow as it goes downstream. Are we going to have a pooling area down on the bottom, or do you just want that to disappear into an underground reservoir where all the pumps and mechanics are, are hidden from view? Yeah, ideally, the bottom, I want it to feel like 
the edge of a dry riverbed is if we're going to nothing. A nice pooling area, and then as we come through, like a nice river crossing would be ideal. The whole point is to have them interact and enrich as many different ways as possible. They love chewing wood, so any logs that we use, we have to consider as temporary. When it comes to the bottom, ideally, I want to keep them away from the pumps, away from any of that equipment. So that final falls, I think we're hoping it's like 8 to 10 feet away from our equipment. Okay, got it. Everything that you're describing to me, it's almost like in certain parts of the world, you have the highland areas where you're going to get precipitation up in the mountains. It's usually a little bit cooler, things like that. We'll have kind of these cascading pools and stuff starting on the on the top. And then as it kind of comes down into the valleys and stuff like that, it literally would kind of be like the dry period of sub-Saharan Africa. And the water literally just disappears into the ground until the rainy period comes. And then it kind of flushes everything back through. I like that from a conceptual standpoint the neat part is the backdrop has some of the oldest rock work that has been done at the zoo is actually predates rockscapes and we've been building there since 86 one of the very first features that were ever done at the zoo so it will feel like you're at the edge of these massive rockscapes where condensation and build up after rainfall would actually happen. That's awesome. Oh, that's gonna, that'll be perfect. I appreciate all your insight, your knowledge, your passion. I'm totally looking forward to working with you and your team. Looking forward to it. All right, awesome. I appreciate it. Thanks, Patrick. We'll be seeing you soon. Hey, what's up everybody? Ed the Pond Professor here, coming to you from my office, Aqualand St. Charles, Illinois, the water garden capital of the world. We have a really, really unique project coming up in front of us. Just had an incredible Zoom call with Patrick. He is with a company called Rockscapes out of Canada. Great customer of ours, and he does some phenomenal work. Patrick has been involved with the Toronto Zoo for decades, himself as well as his father, doing all types of incredible rockscapes. So this is all artificial stone that he cuts and carves and creates to make these amazing zoo structures. But he is also an ecosystem follower. What I mean by that is he loves our ecosystem philosophies of designing and building water features, using nature as a model, using rubber liner, using natural stone, using wetland filtration systems and things like that. What we're doing is we're melding our two concepts together. He has an incredible opportunity right in front of us to do an amazing project. It is going to be for spotted hyenas, which I have never actually worked with before. I've seen them before at zoos and things like that, but I've never actually had an opportunity to work for them. So now is the time and we have an incredible thing that's going to be happening here. So what I want to do right now is I'm going to show you some of the concepts that we're thinking about, as well as a few things that we're going to have to take into consideration during the construction process. So what we have right in front of me, we did a concept drawing. Actually, Sasha did the concept drawing up on of our Canadian office and I believe we are gonna go with this one right over here we're gonna go with the pondless waterfall on the right side of the exhibit but also what I think is unique about this particular one is we are going to be having a large wetland filter all the way at the top starting out just like I discussed with Patrick we're trying to mimic that highland type of an area and that water is gonna kind of collect in these small little pockets and ravines and then it's gonna continue its way down slope, eventually it hits the valley floor. And in sub-Saharan Africa, some of these river systems will literally just dry up and disappear and go down back into the aquifer. And that's exactly what we're going to do. You've seen us design this type of a system before. It's what we call our poundless waterfall. So down here at the bottom, we are gonna have all of our aqua blocks. We're gonna have our pumping system. We're gonna have everything hidden from view. But what I think is very important about this design is it's gonna have a barrier where the hyenas cannot get to the substructure. <laughs> it's not funny, Ed. <laughs> hey, shut up! So we're gonna have our aqua blocks. We're gonna put in a layer of those drainage panels on top to increase the load bearing capacity, as well as to kind of limit some of the maintenance processes for the zoo staff. Then over that entire system, we're gonna come in with large cobblestone and large river rock, and we're going to barricade everything so the hyenas cannot get down into that infrastructure system. The outside perimeter where the liner comes up, I'm gonna to have to come up with a way, and I'm gonna show you that here in a second, to help barricade the liner. Now remember, 
remembering what Patrick said, the hyenas cannot handle rubber inside of their system. So if they get a hold of the rubber liner or the geotextile material could cause an obstruction inside of them, that is the last thing that we want to do. In fact, we're going the complete opposite. We want to create a living aquatic ecosystem, which is actually going to be much better for the hyenas. So what's going to happen when you don't actually add bacteria and have the good microorganisms living inside the ecosystem, you're going to get some nasty stuff, some different types of bacteria and possible viruses and fungi and stuff like that that are going to live in this stagnant anaerobic condition. And that actually can lead to problems, which is exactly why the zoo is following their current course of action. What we want to do is create a better environment for the animals that's going to be not only beneficial for the animals themselves, but also to lower some of the maintenance for the zoo staff, which is why we're going through all all this thought process right now to figure out what we need to do, how we need to do it so we can deliver everything for this incredible, incredible species. So what we're going to have here down at the bottom, like I said, we're going to have all of our aqua blocks. We're going to have our pump vault that's going to have the recirculating pipe system. It's going to send all that water all the way up into that snorkel centipede system. I'm going to distribute that high velocity water under a false bottom. We're going to have a layer of small aqua blocks. The water is going to spread out. We're going to have a sedimentation chamber. Then the water comes into contact with all those different layers of river rock. Well, a biological filter is basically, it is based off of surface area. So once we get past the substructure, everything on top is going to be all natural. It's going to be boulders and river rocks and things like that. When we're designing and building, the structure is actually going to be probably a rectangle or a square. We're going to see how we can fit all the aqua blocks into position. But when we start finishing everything off, we place those boulders where they actually look good to create this more organic form. We're going to take that rubber liner and we oversize it and we take the excess liner and we wrap it back over the top of everything so it makes that square actually disappear. And when we're talking about natural ecosystems, we don't want straight lines. We want curves. We want boulders. We want a lot of free flowing forms. Once we have the water delivered on top, we're going to have that water being distributed through our snorkel and centipede up through the aqua blocks. And you can see here that snorkel vault is basically a cylindrical shaft it comes all the way to the surface. This is going to allow the zoo staff to do periodic maintenance. Once we have that water flowing, it's going to cascade its way down through all of those different grade changes. This is going to create a unique environment for these animals to kind of interact with the water. As Patrick said, during the call, they love when they're filling up that pond. They love that splashing water. So I know we're going to be able to create a series of plunge pools and pockets and things like that where water is going to be cascading over these incredible boulders and the animals will interact exactly the way they would in nature. I'm going to be doing excavation. So down here we have that in situ soil. So that means it is unexcavated. We're going to dig down. It's going to be a good solid surface. Then we're going to come in with our different layers. The first one we're going to do is our heavy duty geotextile, which is going to create a barrier between the soil and the rubber lining. The second layer is going to be that rubber membrane. This layer is EPDM membrane. This is going to provide a waterproof membrane where water cannot soak from the surface down into that subsoil. Now, because of the animals, we're gonna to have to add a few layers on top of this rubber liner. The next layer is gonna be a second layer of the heavy duty geotextile. And then on top of that, we're gonna come in what we call a concrete cloth. This is a, a very incredible material. It has a rubber membrane on one part, and then it has a geotextile material. It's kind of expanded. It's almost, it's a three dimensional membrane. Inside of that, it is embedded with Portland cement. So when you saturate this membrane, it's going to create a rock hard surface that will be impervious to the animals from digging and things like that. So I want to protect these rubber liners and all these other membranes down below everything. That concrete cloth is going to do it for us. What I don't want to do is I don't want to have this concrete cloth visible. So we're going to cover it with boulders and large river rocks and things like that. So it really makes it difficult for the animals to get to this membrane in the first place. I'm going to excavate things a little bit differently. And that's because I've seen this happen in other exhibits with animals. Sometimes when the animals get happy and they want to lay in the water, I see it at my own personal pond. 
on where my dog will actually lay inside the stream. But what happens when they're cooling off, if you have that animal laying right here in between this, they're gonna block the water flow. They literally will be like a dam. That water is gonna kind of well up inside and it has to have a way to get out. So what I don't want them to do is block the water flow and all of a sudden they cause a leak of some sort. So by having this system over excavated, by having multiple layers inside of the feature, now if they block this up, my rubber membrane is going to come all the way up well above that normal water level. If there is any blockage or anything like that, it's not going to leak out. The other thing that we're going to want to do, and you can see I have my rubber membrane kind of coming up high over in here and then I have more boulders over here on this outside edge to help protect everything so we're going to barricade all of that stuff so if the animals come in they're gonna to have to go through large boulders large river rocks and things like that before they will get to the membranes and I think that's the safest course of action now because of this it's literally gonna double if not triple the amount of stone that we would normally use so normally when I'm designing a feature I'm just thinking of these rocks down here in this lower section. Now I'm gonna have a whole second layer of more boulders going out further in all directions around the entire feature. So this is gonna add substantially to the amount of stone as well as to the amount of time it's gonna to take to, to pull this off. Thankfully, they have all the rock that we need right on site. This project has a lot of incredible details that I haven't even thought of yet at this point. And I know we're gonna get more things once we get on the job site because that is the nature of what we do. Designing and building living, breathing ecosystems that are gonna provide the necessary function as well as the aesthetics. This feature is going to be highly visible from all the visitors going through this incredible zoo. So we wanna make sure that we've created a system that's healthy for the animals but it's also enjoyable and aesthetically pleasing for all the guests that are going to be going through and seeing this amazing feature. And I know for one, I cannot wait to see these incredible animals interacting with the water feature once it's completed. Stay tuned. This is going to be one incredible project. Hey.